tonight on CBC Vancouver News. Our land's going to be all ripped up and it's going to be destroyed. Mounties move in. Officers enforce a court order at a First Nations anti-pipeline camp. Plus... That's pretty selfish. It breaks my heart. I mean, this is what makes our city beautiful. Cutting controversy. Was the Spanish bank's tree topper trying to make it look accidental? And... The surface of the glaciers was the dirtiest I've, I've ever seen it. Dirty glaciers fear that fallout from BC's wildfires will speed up the melt. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. Tense moments in northern BC today with RCMP trying to enforce a court injunction against a First Nation blockade. Protesters have cut off a key access point for construction crews working on the Coastlink GasLink LNG pipeline. The group says the company isn't authorized to build the project on its traditional territory. The CBC's Renee Filipponi has our top story. Late this morning, RCMP arrived, as expected, to this camp on a remote logging road on Wet'suwet'en traditional territory. They were there to enforce a court injunction, shut down the camp, and open this blockade. Oh, we haven't let anybody come through. Uh, we've only let people go out. People trying to get to the camp were stopped by police, 20 kilometers out, as RCMP helicopters flew overhead. The tensions are high with so many questions in the air. These four hereditary chiefs have been fighting to protect this land for years. We live off the land, we live off the water, and we pick berries, we pick plants. So those are very important things to us, and especially the Wutsinkwa is where all the salmon go to spawn. The Wet'suwet'en First Nation has never signed a treaty, and according to the landmark 1997 Delgamuk Supreme Court case, that means they haven't extinguished their rights to this land. So according to the people here, they should have a say in what happens to it. And sometimes there's misunderstanding and uh, lack of respect. Local MP Nathan Cullen was here today urging for a peaceful resolution. And here we have two political systems uh, engaging with each other, the traditional system and uh, Canada's, and uh, it's a bit messy sometimes. Trans Canada, the company behind the pipeline, says 20 First Nations band councils support the project and have spoken about how the economic benefits from this project could provide a better future for their people. But the hereditary chiefs here disagree, and it's created tension within the nation. They say the elected band councils only have authority over what happens on reserve and not over the thousands of square kilometers of Wet'suwet'en traditional territory. There is no price tag on our territory, never. It's been passed down from one generation to another and the land replenishes itself every year. For now, police aren't giving any information about their plans as the tensions remain hot on a very cold night. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, near Houston, B.C. Five years have passed since one of the worst mining disasters in Canadian history. And today, the operator of the Mount Pauly mine says it is shutting down its operations. CBC Vancouver News at 11 host Dan Burrett joins us live with more now. Dan, why is the company doing this? This is massive news for people near Williams Lake, Anita and Mike. Imperial Metal says it's halting operations because of falling copper prices. It expects to halt work there by the end of May. Now, as we know, the Mount Pauly mine was the scene of a massive spill almost five years ago. And who can forget these pictures? In August 2014, its tailings pond broke, sending 24 million cubic meters of mining waste and sludge into nearby waterways. Two reports found the collapse was caused by a poorly designed dam that didn't take into account draining and erosion failures. It fully reopened in 2017 with a reinforced dam. Imperial Metals says the looming work stoppage will not affect its ongoing environmental monitoring and remediation. And the company says it will resume full operations there once mining is more profitable. This is very worrying, though, for the hundreds of workers who are at that mine. Liberal MLH for the Caribou Chilcotin, Donna Barnett, says it's devastating for workers and their families. We have calls into Imperial Metals, the Workers' Union, and we're reaching out to the province as well. We'll have much more tonight at 11. Thanks very much, Dan.
A defense lawyer for a man charged with murdering a young girl in Merritt says his client lied when he confessed to the crime. Gary Hanlon has pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder in the 1978 slaying of 12-year-old Monica Jack. After 40 years of waiting for justice, Jack's mother says she just wants peace. The CBC's Angela Sterrett reports from B.C. Supreme Court. Monica Jack's mother, Madeline Lenaro, quietly wept in court as she listened to defense lawyers argue that Hanlon was not responsible for the 1978 murder of her daughter. Patrick Angley focused on what he calls psychological manipulation of Hanlon by a fictitious crime boss in a Mr. Big operation. Flanked by her brother, sister and an advocate, Lenaro says the trial has been exhausting. Honestly, it was, seemed like no end. You know, the ups and downs, ups and downs. Sometimes too many downs, no many ups. <laughs> is life. And life would be different if we didn't come in, come in, if anything didn't happen to our family. Even though her daughter was killed 40 years ago, the pain still runs deep. So much that Lenaro searches for strength just to talk about her daughter. She enjoyed life. But it was taken from her. In court, defense lawyer Angley called Hanlon, quote, not a deep thinker who was not clearly thinking when he confessed to the murder in 2014. He blamed the police and the media for providing details about the crime and said Hanlon was a notorious liar and was just boasting about the murder, trying to fit in with the fictitious criminal organization. Last week, prosecutor Gordon Maddy argued that there is enough evidence, including witness statements, dental records, and the videotape confession from Hanlon to prove beyond a reasonable doubt he is guilty. We'll carry on, because life is carrying on. Closure, I... What is closure? I don't think there is a closure. Because it's still going to be there in our hearts. Our head, minds, every time, you know, it's, it's always that void. Lenaro told the CBC that after 40 years, she just wants peace. The jury is set to begin their deliberations this week. Angela Starrett, CBC News, Vancouver. There's been a terrible accident in Nanaimo. An eight-year-old boy has died after being hit by a pickup truck. Officers say the boy was riding his bike out of his driveway when it happened just before noon yesterday, and he was wearing a helmet. It's just a tragic incident for everybody involved. Our victim services are assisting with the family. We have our school liaison officers are advised because the young boy was in the school district. They have extra grief counselors in place as well. RCMP say the driver of the truck stayed at the scene. Alcohol, speed and drugs aren't believed to be involved. Number of people stopped to try to help the boy, but left before investigators could talk to them. Those people are now being asked to contact police. BCRCMP are urging you to slow down after a number of weekend crashes that killed a total of four people. On Friday, a sedan crossed the center line and collided with a transport truck near Field, BC, killing a young Alberta woman. The sedan driver was also badly hurt. A similar crash happened on Sunday, this time near Fernie. A car reportedly crossed the center line, hitting a commercial van as well as another vehicle. Police say the driver was not wearing a seatbelt and died in the crash. RCMP want to talk to anyone with information about these accidents or two others that left a man and woman dead. Well, a new twist tonight in the Spanish Bank's tree topping story. We still don't know who took a saw to them. But there is evidence to suggest whoever did it was trying to make it look accidental. The CBC's Megan Batchelor has the latest. A nice day to take in a view from a Spanish bank's park bench. That view a little different thanks to some unwanted pruning. Well, I'm very disappointed. I think our trees are treasures. And uh, sneaking around, cutting it down for their own, their own purposes, I think is really disappointing. Police were seen canvassing the area today, hoping to get answers of who lobbed off the tops of 10 trees at the foot of Tolmy Street. It's suspected someone did it to improve the view from their home. It breaks my heart. I mean, this is what makes our city beautiful. And if it's somebody wanting a view, like that's not acceptable. It's just not. 
The city will do what it can, but the trees will never be the same. It just stunts the growth. The, the, the tree will live, but the tree will grow out as opposed to up. So our, our goal will be to try to train a new leader that will then keep going up and make it a healthy tree as best we can, but it's very challenging. Some of the treetops still litter the ground here at Spanish Banks, and officials say that they actually show some evidence that perhaps whoever did this was trying to make it look accidental. Well, if you look at the, some of them, they've been cut uh, probably a little bit uh, this maybe this fall or late this fall, and then they were cut three quarters of the way through. And of course, in this last big wind, uh, two or three of them snapped off, and you can see the rip marks on the bark. So that would tell me that somebody was pretty uh, clever in what they were trying to do and disguise it as maybe just being broken off during a storm. Norman estimates it would cost around $15,000 to replace the trees. It's something the city isn't considering, though, because they sit on First Nation land. There's an agreement no digging can be done, but people who enjoy the beach just want someone to be caught. It's really rough, right? I mean, it's, it's a community thing, right? And, and we live here. We just live off the street. and I don't know. You hate to see anything happen to the environment locally. I mean, it's, it's a beautiful part of the world. Megan Batchelor, CBC News, Vancouver. It was a gorgeous day outside today. Beautiful, yeah. yeah really yes. nice. A Jones beauty. To tell us more about it. <laughs> yes, it was a beauty day out there, but we've uh, lost the sun and gained the chill. It is quite a cool evening out here, but man, it was really nice to get a bit of a break, especially uh, for those of us who uh, headed back to work or school after the holidays. A nice ease in with some blue skies, but northwesterly winds certainly made it uh, brisk earlier today, closing the seawall for a, a portion of the day. Temperatures are dropping tonight. I want to show you uh, the currents right now. We're going to get one of our coldest nights so far this season, two right now at YVR. Nanaimo across the street already down to a minus one. I think we'll end up around minus two tonight with a brisk outflow wind. It'll feel more like minus six tomorrow. So we do have wind warnings in place for how sound those northerly winds uh, racing down the strait and they'll be racing down the valley as well. So that's where we're going to see the coldest of the air. Note the special weather statement we also have in place. This is for Metro Vancouver, the island, the Sunshine Coast, the possibility of wet snow tomorrow. That's because we've got a very wet system sliding in from the south, colliding with this very cold air in place, a recipe we have not seen that often here on the south coast. I don't think it's going to be a big snow event, but the special weather statement is there as a heads up. I'll time it out a little later on in the show. Uh, it's going to probably start off as some wet snow for parts of Metro Vancouver. Just slight accumulations, but enough that uh, we could be talking about it. So I'll uh, time it out coming up. Looking forward to talking about it. Thanks very much, <laughs> Joe. You're welcome. A Langley mom is making some headway on her petition to ban smoking in condos. Naomi Baker's MLA has agreed to take her petition to the legislature in Victoria. As Leanne Young reports tonight, a blanket ban may not be as simple as it sounds. Well, you can see it here. So my husband has actually put spray foam in all along the carpet. There are some unusual finishes inside Naomi Baker's condominium, taped up thermostats, clumps of spray foam and sealed outlets. Every nook and cranny where smoke can drift in, Baker and her husband have tried to seal it shut. Smoking is allowed in her building, but the new mom says that shouldn't be the case. I don't see what a couple cigarettes a day could do. Well, that's fine, but in 20 years, if I have cancer or if my daughter has allergies and other respiratory issues, then who's going who's gonna to be accountable to that? She's filed multiple complaints to her strata, but still the smoke wafts in. I mean, it's better. It's better than before we did all that, but it still hasn't worked. So five months ago, she started a petition to change things. She wants all strata buildings to be smoke-free by default. And if individual buildings want to be smoke-friendly three quarters of condo owners would have to vote for it. It would be more reflective of, you know, the over 87% of the population that doesn't smoke. And the fact that we know it's a known health hazardous issue. Her petition has garnered more than 13,000 signatures online and another 700 on paper. And she's found a new champion, Langley MLA, Mary Polak. We probably all remember uh, when first smoking was banned from restaurants. Now I'm sure people in my daughter's generation, they can't even imagine the idea of having a smoking section in a restaurant. So times change. Polak says she's even considering introducing a private member's bill, but a blanket ban won't be as easy as it sounds. The Condo Homeowners Association says most buildings are already smoke-free. It's generally because there are a number of 
a higher percentage of people in the building who smoke. Um, uh, or the other side of it is uh, owners don't want to restrict, they feel like they don't want to restrict property use rights uh, and they want to allow people to have the choice. And that might be the issue that Baker's bill could run into. Housing Minister Selena Robinson wasn't available today, but her ministry responded to our requests with a statement. In it, it points to existing policies that already ban smoking in public and shared common spaces. It also points to the Strata Property Act, which allows buildings to decide for themselves if they choose to be smoke free. Baker says she knows changing provincial legislation might be a long shot. So I think the future is now. It's time. Leanne Young, CBC News, Langley. A local court battle centering around the theft of a diamond-encrusted 8-kilogram eagle statue has gotten a little more complicated. Lloyd's Underwriters is fighting an insurance payout order on the solid gold statue. The bird was stolen in an alleged mugging in 2016, but there have been discrepancies around its value and whether the owner had proper security with him at the time of the theft. A court ordered Lloyd's to honor the insurance claim last month, but in new court filings, Lloyd's says it is fighting the court order. For more on this, you can go to our website, cbc.ca slash bc. And while you are online, make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channel and are following us on Facebook. Just search CBC Vancouver on either platform. And if you missed the show or are tuning in late every uh, night at 6 o'clock, our newscast, well, after 6 o'clock and during 6 o'clock at all times, our newscast <laughs> is streaming live uh, on demand on both platforms commercial free. Well, the city of White Rock has a timeline for rebuilding its historic pier, but it's not good news for some businesses relying on tourism. We'll tell you why. Coming up. Good evening to our viewers watching on our website, Facebook, or YouTube. Now, downsizing isn't easy, especially if you've been living in the same house for more than 40 years. Yeah, it's a long time, but that's exactly what a Vancouver couple living in one of the oldest homes in Kitsilano did this weekend. The house at 1833 U Street has new owners and its future is uncertain. So they sold basically everything inside, drawing crowds of interested buyers and even some collectors. There's not much in the way of city archives about this place, you know, and no, no old photographs at all. It was built about 1895, 1900, before they really surveyed all the roads. Uh, I think this is its original site. Some people have told us it's been moved a few feet or whatever. Ah. Well, we're downsizing our 40-year collection. Uh, we're, we're looking at the probability, possibility of moving out of this place. Uh, and so we have to downsize. Also, we've been talking for years, like, we've got so much stuff. We can't display it all. We can't enjoy it all. So let's push it out into the world where it's going to get enjoyed. It's a good experiment to see how, how do I actually feel when I let go of something that I've always assumed was really important. We just went for a coffee and saw the sign to say indoor garage sale, which was intriguing as well as it's cold outside, so we didn't want to go outside. I did get a pin that says dirty old men need loving too. 25 cents, bargain. My grandfather clock, my family's been carrying it around for 200 years. When I was a teenager, my, one of my spinster aunts called up and said, this is going out, it's going to be on the sidewalk. If you want it, come and get it now. So I went and got it, and then I brought it over to Canada when I emigrated, and I think, yeah, it's lovely, and it works, but it's just time to let it go. 200 years is a long time to be carrying around a piece of... Uh, piece of clockwork. Really it's the stories you want to pass on as much as the stuff. But will the stories stay with the new owners? I don't know. I don't know. There's a lot of interesting stuff there. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure we can find a way to get you some of it for your house. A lot of it may be going to the transfer station eventually, but uh, some of it looks uh, some of it looks pretty cool. I had one of those little pianos. Organs, 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 yeah, yeah. 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 That's good. Maybe uh -huh. maybe that's what I need to get a little <laughs> nostalgia going. Sure, why not? <laughs> uh, one small request from us to you, the viewer. If you like what we do here, um, let us know by liking this video, commenting on the show, and sharing the live stream with your friends and family. 
We're going to be back with more news in just a few moments right here on CDC News Vancouver. After that devastating windstorm in December, the city of White Rock is hoping to rebuild its historic pier by the end of summer. That's welcome news for many living in the area, but business owners are disappointed it won't be ready before the tourist season. John Hernandez reports. Nestled between two boarded up shops, Jan's on the beach is open for business. Owner Janet Waite has been here for seven years, but it hasn't always been easy. But it's been construction the last you know, year and a half. So that's been, uh, that's been tough, losing a lot of parking. For months, these businesses have withstood major redevelopments on the waterfront. Then this happened. A severe storm snapped the historic pier in half just two weeks ago. Or as locals on Marine owner Tyler Laguerre sums it up. Icing on the cake for everything else. Just, yeah, another obstacle. Laguerre is concerned the damaged pier could be a detrimental blow to many already struggling businesses. While the streets were busy with curious visitors shortly after the storm, things here have slowed. The promenade is now completely fenced off at the pier, turning walkers away. They're looking for us to try and get the job done as quickly as we can. Mayor Daryl Walker knows the project is urgent. Shops here would like to see the pier reopened before the typically busy summer season. But that's not going to happen. I'm going to, to take a rough guess and say we probably won't have much done before mid to late August. That's an unfortunate fact. The city will need to secure funding from the province and the federal government before it moves ahead. Early estimates put the project at $6 million, but that number could swell. The total extent of the damage is still unknown, and officials say the entire pier might have to be rebuilt. That means more construction on these streets. We hope that the reconstruction of the pier, the repair of the pier, uh, has as minimal an impact on the transportation system as possible. Many residents have pledged to do their part. I do support the local businesses. If I come for lunch, I come down to the pier generally. But these stores depend on more than just the locals. If you like the restaurants down here, if you like the businesses, you got to make your way down, try and support us. Otherwise, uh, you're going to see some more closed doors. Doors that might not open even when the summer rolls around. John Hernandez, CBC News, White Rock. Federal NDP leader Jagmeet Singh has been out campaigning ahead of a by-election that will likely happen next month. As the CBC's Tanya Fletcher reports, an NDP loss in Burnaby South may be enough to strip Singh of his title as party leader. <laughs> Jagmeet Singh had hoped today would be the official launch of his campaign. No such luck. It looks like Trudeau is again delaying calling by-elections here in Burnaby South and for the hundreds of thousands of Canadians who are going to continue to not have representation. For some, Singh's response is simply deflection from a leader growing desperate. I think there is quite a lot of pressure on him to be able to win in this, uh, this by-election. A lot of pressure because 2018 was a tough year for the party. At least nine of 41 sitting MPs say they won't run again. And then there's the fundraising slump. While the Conservatives and Liberals took in record amounts in the fall, the NDP did its worst yet under Singh. And until he wins his seat, he doesn't have a voice in the House of Commons, a stark contrast to his predecessor. The Prime Minister keeps referring us back to the whitewashed report of the Senate. You want to be in a position where you can be jousting in the House of Commons, where you can be uh, you know, on the national news every night because you're part of the narrative in uh, Ottawa as opposed to somebody trying to rebuild the party or rebuild uh, the party under their image uh, from outside. He's also an outsider in the riding he's fighting to represent. NDP! NDP! Born in Ontario, he only recently moved to Burnaby. But the NDP says it's beat those odds before. And Tommy Douglas is, of course, uh, somebody who resonates with people throughout Burnaby. Uh, somebody who is from back east, but chose to run in Burnaby as the national leader of the NDP. I think there's a tradition there as well that people respond very positively to. If Singh loses, though, the implications are staggering for his party 
and his career. It just won't be that he didn't win this by-election or he does win the by-election. It's a further test of a leader to just be able to get them ready for an election, which everyone knows is coming. At today's rally, a chalkboard filled with slogans like history in the making and we got this. All signs pointing towards a confident candidate who has everything to lose. <laughs> Tanya Fletcher, CBC News, Burnaby. Their surfaces are blackened from BC's wildfires. What scientists fear will happen to these mountain glaciers coming up. Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. We have been on this land from time immemorial. Mounties are enforcing a court order at a First Nations anti-pipeline camp in northern BC. The group has been blocking an access point for construction crews working on an LNG pipeline project. The RCMP broke down a gate at the checkpoint and stood face to face with protesters. I would tell me that somebody was pretty uh, clever in what they were trying to do and disguise it as maybe just being broken off during a storm. The Vancouver Park Board says there's evidence to suggest whoever topped 10 trees in a Spanish Banks area park was likely trying to make it look accidental. Replacing the trees would cost $15,000. It's something the city isn't considering because they sit on First Nation land.
BC's devastating wildfire season is having a lasting impact hundreds of kilometers away in the Rocky and Columbia Mountains. Take a look at these images. As you can see, the surface of glaciers there is black. Scientists say it's soot from last summer's wildfires, and they fear forest fire fallout will speed up the melt of glaciers already in retreat. Soot and smoke contribute to the melting of glaciers as dark ice absorbs more sunlight. Some pretty incredible Probably images there. Disturbing too. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Uh, CBC meteorologist Johanna Wagstaff has been looking into this tale of ice and fire for us. And Johanna, the glacier's physical appearance isn't the only thing that is changing here. That's right, Anita. In fact, it's the taste of the water. And the reason we know that is a PhD student, Ben uh, Pelto, was doing his field work in the Rockies and Columbia Mountains over the past five years. Uh, here he is uh, standing on a, a glacier in the Rockies. And one of the perks uh, alongside the beautiful views, drinking glacial water straight from the source. And the past couple of summers, he noticed how much the water had tasted like soot. But uh, I want to show you more of these uh, incredible pictures uh, from, again, those glaciers just in the past couple of years. And you can see how dirty they look. And that is what is most concerning to scientists the fact that indeed the albedo of the ice is changing, that's a word to describe the ref reflectivity of a surface. And generally the darker uh, a surface is, the more it absorbs solar radiation and the warmer it gets. So that's the big concern right now, Mike and Anita. Okay, so looking ahead, uh, what might this mean for those glaciers and, and also for the wildfires down the road? That's the big question because the rate of melt is quite hard to uh, measure and this is quite new research. I want to uh, take you to a glaciologist out of the University of Calgary who's looking at this big picture right now. Take a listen. If you're getting a bad fire season, it's already hot and dry. It's already a tough summer for the glaciers. So if we're actually getting these darker glaciers these summers, it's just like a, kind of kick when you're down a little bit. It's even worse. It's a potentially important effect that's missing right now in our models. So for the river forecast projections for Alberta and Saskatchewan, it's pretty important to know how long these glaciers will be with us. And it's starting to look like the fires will be part of that story. So scientists have started to turn their attention to this phenomenon on both sides of the Rockies because, as you heard right now, this uh, positive feedback loop hasn't been entered into our long-range climate models. So uh, this is going to be something scientists will uh, look more into over the next uh, couple of years, and I'll keep you posted. Well, we look forward to that. Thanks, Joe. You're welcome. Well, you're looking at a live shot of downtown Vancouver. Looks pretty good as it did all day, but dipping to below zero tonight, that means a dry overnight. Uh, but get ready for more wet weather tomorrow. Johanna is sticking around and has the full forecast next.
Wow, some pretty strong waves there. This is the Stanley Park seawall this morning. Anyone trying to go for a run or a bike ride was basically out of luck. A king tide along with wind sent water crashing onto the path, forcing the city to close the pathway between Third Beach and the Lionsgate Bridge. The seawall reopened around noon. Could do some whitewater rafting, I guess. I yeah. know that. Conditions were perfect, perfect for, that. for that. Yeah, pretty I didn't intense. realize it was so windy. That's no. crazy. Yeah, it was quite brisk, and those winds coming in from the northwest, so that is why it also felt chilly mm -hmm. out there. But uh, you ain't felt nothing yet when it comes to those drop in temperatures. <laughs> Let me take you through the time lapse. A reminder of what a nice break it was this morning. Uh, high pressure building in, again, bringing those brisk winds, but beautiful clearing skies. This high pressure system, though, Really just a one-day wonder, so hope you got out to enjoy it. Those clear skies are sticking around tonight, and as I mentioned, that's really helping to drop our temperatures, getting down to wind chills of minus 5 to minus 6 for Metro Vancouver, more like minus double digits as we head out to the Fraser Valley. A uh, quick look at that wind warning again for how sound and special weather statement in place for most of the south coast for the possibility of wet snow tomorrow. So let's try and break that down. Uh, because of this big Pacific storm that's sliding in from the southwest, it's bringing wet and mild mild weather colliding with that cooler air in place across most of the province. So first of all, the next 12 hours uh, down to a minus two overnight. And then as I take you through the rest of the day, just back up to a three. So through those morning hours through the afternoon, uh, when that rain moves in, which will be around the noon hour, things may start off as wet snow. Now, there's a better chance we'll see that happen in the uh, inland sections of the valley, again, where we have that cold outflow and higher elevations of Metro Vancouver, but not out of the question. We could see some wet snow uh, at all elevations through the afternoon hours. Temperatures will be warming through the day, and as I take you through the overnight overcast to start, precip sort of filling in after the noon hour. And again, this model actually not showing a lot of the wet snow, but because of those temperatures, I do think there is a chance. Uh, bigger picture, Here's that system sliding up from the southwest. It takes a while to fill in, but notice the blue as it collides with that cool air. The mountain's definitely getting a good dumping uh, with this system that will spread snow across the northern sections of our province as well, uh, scattered though into the cooler air that's also in place across the north. And as we continue to tap into that southwesterly flow and our temperatures continue to rise tomorrow night into Wednesday, things will change over to rain. So how much are we talking? We're really making a big deal about this because it is the first time uh, we're likely to see some wet snow on the ground. For most of Metro Vancouver, we're talking trace amounts, maybe enough to see your footprint in there. Uh, higher elevations, closer to five centimeters. This isn't a big event, but enough that it could be a messy one. Let me take you to the seven day forecast where conditions will continue to warm up past tomorrow. So get through a bit of wet snow and then rising temperatures Tuesday night into Wednesday will change things over to rain. Wednesday is a bit of a washout, so whatever we get down here will not stick around for the rest of the week. I know some of us here at this very table are excited about snow. <laughs> so I was actually out on the Fraser uh, for a story that we're going to be airing later this week mm -hmm. today, and there it snowed for about three minutes. Oh, were you so excited? <laughs> yeah. I'm happy you I'm happy you saw it. More of that tomorrow, hopefully, just Good. for you. can't wait. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks Jeff. very much. Okay, uh, a warning about our next story. It may lead to a severe case of puppy love. Especially for these two. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Some truly great volunteers across the country are part of a new program run by the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. As the CBC's Holly Couric explains, they are puppy raisers. Bye. Downtown. 11-month-old golden retriever Grace is about to embark on the next phase of her journey to becoming a set of eyes for someone who's visually impaired. I've taken her everywhere. She's managed the bus, she's managed, um, you know, busy downtowns, um, sirens, noises. Jane McSwiggin is a volunteer puppy raiser for the Canadian National Institute for the Blind. Good girl, there you go. Yes. She's had the dog since she was eight weeks old, but in February, Grace will head to Ottawa for the next phase of her training. Walk nice. Good girl. There you go. That's better. McSwigan takes Grace everywhere she goes. She's the only Winnipeg pup that goes to an office environment every day. It's wonderful that she can come to work with me and learn the ropes of being at an office all day where you ha she has to be quiet. She comes to meetings. She has to um, sit here and be quiet. You sit. McSwigan said one of the biggest challenges is educating people about how to interact with a service dog. 
When Grace is wearing her guide dog vest, it's important for her to be free from distractions. That includes people who are looking to pet her. The joke is you're training the humans, not the dog. Come on, let's go. CNIB's puppy raising supervisor, Andrea Critch, said the program relies on volunteers to raise the dogs until they're about 12 to 15 months old and can begin formal training. Where they'll learn to find the curb, locate empty chairs, locate buttons and just really be sound and not you know, nervous in any sort of situation. There are 53 dogs currently in the program across the country. Six have already graduated. McSwiggin said despite how hard it is to say goodbye, she'd do it all over again. Holly Carrick, CBC News, Winnipeg. Well, we often hear about children with food-related allergies. Coming up, what the results of a new study reveal when it comes to adults. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. CBC Vancouver is a proud sponsor of the PUSH International Performing Arts Festival. Expand your horizon and catch groundbreaking performances January 17th to February 3rd. And get your tickets and join CBC Vancouver's Anita Bath and Dan Burrett as they co-host the BIV Top 40 Under 40 Awards on January 24th. For more on these events, check us out online. We often talk about allergies in kids, but a new U.S. study has found a surprising number of people are developing serious food-related allergies as adults. Many of them are going undiagnosed, potentially putting themselves in life-threatening danger. CBC's Christine Birak has the story. At the time we were in front of the emergency room, I couldn't breathe. American Christine Collins now carries an epinephrine auto-injector everywhere she goes. After eating shellfish her entire life, she developed a life-threatening food allergy in her 20s, and she's not alone. And that number is high. It's actually higher than what we even see in kids. Based on a U.S. survey of over 40,000 adults, one in 10 had a serious food allergy. And almost half developed their allergy in adulthood, raising important questions for researchers. I'm very, very curious about a lot of the things you're curious about. Um, one of the main ones is what is that environmental component that is triggering allergies in adulthood? 
The most common allergy in adults was shellfish, including shrimp, crab and lobster, followed by milk and peanuts. Why it's increasing is something that we have to keep studying and keep trying to understand a bit better. Toronto allergist Dr. Gordon Sussman says the study also found while 10% of adults were deemed to have a serious food allergy, almost 20% of respondents thought they did. If they think they have an allergy but it's never confirmed, they avoid foods, but that also affects their quality of life, poorer quality of life. It also affects the economics because they get EpiPens and they go, or they get epinephrine auto injectors and they go to the emergency room and it's something that needs to be addressed. Food intolerances and oral sensitivity can often be mistaken for allergies. The only way to know for sure is to be properly diagnosed. Go and get checked out by an allergist. Get a blood test and be sure because you don't want to find out the hard way. Christine Burak, CBC News, Toronto. It is a startling number in an ongoing crisis. More than 9,000 Canadians have died from opioid-related overdoses since 2016. Now there's another concern raised about a different kind of drug, pills used to treat anxiety and insomnia. The CBC's Richard Cuthbertson reports. This is my secret stash of the ones when he's little. In her bungalow on the outskirts of Amherst, Nova Scotia, Wendy Golden keeps the photos of her son, 20-year-old Cody, stored away. They're just too painful to remain on the walls. He was fun, he was loyal, he was honest. On June 24th, 2014, she found Cody unconscious on the couch. The ambulance arrived and tried everything they could to uh, bring him back, but there was nothing that they could do. Cody died after taking the opioid methadone and a benzodiazepine called clonazepam. Both had been given to him by a co-worker at the New Brunswick fish plant where they worked. Benzodiazepines have been around for six decades. The brand names, such as Valium and Ativan, are ubiquitous. But, like opioids, they can slow down breathing, and that can be lethal. And this is where people who fall under our care begin their journey. Dr. So Matthew Bowes is chief medical officer day. for Nova Scotia. Well, there's really good evidence that if you give benzodiazepines together with opioids, you increase the risk of death uh, by intoxication. Since 2011, there have been more than 440 opioid-related fatalities in Nova Scotia. In more than half those cases, a benzodiazepine contributed to the death. The reasons are complicated. Some people with opioid addictions have mental health issues. They are self-medicating with benzodiazepines. Others who are on the sedatives may be prescribed opioids following an injury. But there's another concern. People are reaching for benzodiazepines to deal with the anxiety of opioid withdrawal. And sometimes, according to addiction specialist Dr. Dave Martel, they're getting them from doctors. I think therein lies the danger in that they're out in the community and being combined at times with opioids that can produce this kind of overdose. Nova Scotia is now trying to keep better track of benzodiazepines. In October, it added the class of drugs to its prescription monitoring program. Richard Cuthbertson, CBC News, Amherst, Nova Scotia. Canadian officials visiting China have told Beijing our country wants two Canadian detainees released immediately. But as the CBC's Sasha, Sasha Petrasik tells us, it's not clear whether the message will have any real impact. It was a day full of smiles and photos as the Canadian parliamentary group toured Shanghai. In stop after stop, they had lunch with politicians from the Shanghai People's Congress. They toured an NGO centre and the iconic Oriental Pearl Tower. By all accounts, it seemed like a routine visit meant to foster better relations between Canada and China. Except, of course, there's nothing routine about relations between the countries these days. They have been going downhill rapidly, upended by the arrests here in China last month of two Canadians who are still being interrogated by Chinese security forces and they face very serious accusations. Well, today, apparently, all of this came to a head in an hour-long meeting between Chinese officials and the 
Canadian parliamentary group. That, according to the leader of that group, Senator Joseph Day, a Liberal. The gist of the message is that the, uh, that the, uh, the, the executive branch of Canada has asked for their immediate release. Day says that came after Chinese officials demanded to know why Canada was holding Meng Wanzhou, the Huawei executive who was arrested at Washington's request. China believes there's politics involved, that the leaders of the U.S. and Canada want to put pressure on Beijing through the Huawei arrest. So, did any of this change the uh, prospects for the two Canadians who are held in Chinese jails? Whoever knows on these things, I think the fact that we had an open and frank discussion, and it was, it was very frank, there was nothing held back on this. Uh, I think any time you do that, that creates opportunities. And for the record, there's been no change in the Chinese position in any of this. Sasha Petrosek, CBC News, Shanghai. An 18-year-old woman fleeing her family in Saudi Arabia will be allowed to stay in Thailand temporarily. She claims she faces death if sent home. Today, the UN's refugee agency announced it will review her case. We have strongly advocated with the Thai government and we have received reassurances that pending the completion of the assessment and any decision, she would not be sent back. That review is expected to take a week. Rahaf Mohammed al Kunan was on her way to Australia, hoping to claim asylum when she was detained in Bangkok. She claims male family members often beat her and that she would be killed if sent back. When her story circulated on Twitter, it sparked international outrage. Human rights activists are appealing to Western democracies, including the U.S., U.K., Australia, and Canada, for help. The spokesperson for Global Affairs says Canada is very concerned by her situation. Big move, 800,000 kilos, 96 meters long and 13 meters high. We'll tell you where this bad boy is headed next. All right, Hollywood Awards season got underway last night. Mm -hmm. Golden Globes, who watched? Definitely. Totally. Did you? I saw it, I watched the beginning just for the jokes, and yeah. then I watched the end. Oh, okay. So you're not as hardcore as you and I are. We were pretty hardcore. Yeah. yeah. I liked Andy Samberg and, and Sandra. Sandra, oh, they, they were great. great. And yeah. Carol Burnett was fantastic. Mm. Yeah. That was it. a good show, uh, packed with a lot of laughs, surprises, and 
a lot of talk about diversity. Mm -hmm. CBC Entertainment reporter Eli Glossner has more on how it all went down. We are going to have some fun, give out some awards, and one lucky audience member will host the Oscars! <laughs> The Golden Globes are not the Oscars, but host Andy Samberg and Sandra Oh set the tone, poking fun at the changing face of Hollywood, highlighting the success of films such as Black Panther and Crazy Rich Asians. Crazy Rich Asians is nominated tonight for Best Picture, Musical or Comedy. It is the first studio film with an Asian American lead since Ghost in the Shell and Aloha. <laughs> Yeah, that was Emma Stone yelling, I'm sorry for her role as a Hawaiian Chinese character from the 2015 film, Aloha. Ottawa's own Sandra Oh already made history when she stepped on the stage as the first Asian actor to co-host the show, but Oh wasn't done. She made history again, winning Best Actress for her performance in Killing Eve. On top of her 2006 win for Grey's Anatomy, she's now the first Asian actor to take home two Golden Globes. But in her acceptance speech, she focused on the people who brought her there. There are two people here tonight that I am so grateful that they're here with me. I'd like to, t to thank my mother and my father. Oma, Appa. Saraneo. Canada's Sandra Oh telling her parents she loves them in Korean. While there isn't much correlation between the 90 or so voters for the Golden Globes and the close to 8,000 members who vote for the Oscars, last night the Globes helped make Bohemian Rhapsody a serious award season threat. The movie about the life of Queen frontman Freddie Mercury won two Globes, including one for Best Actor for Rami Malek. The movie Green Book also raised its profile, taking home three awards, including Best Comedy, Screenplay, and Best Supporting Actor for Mahershala Ali. Both movies have faced criticism for the artistic liberties the creators have taken with the real people the movies are based on. But the fact is, with Golden Globe wins, both movies are now Oscar contenders. Eli Glaster, CBC News, Toronto. Very nice. Bring on the Oscars. Yeah. Yeah. That one I'll watch all the and way it's through. Entire, yeah. We have yeah, a lot of movie do. watching to do until then. We do. <laughs> And uh, a group of Good Samaritans armed with shovels took to the streets in St. John's, Newfoundland over the weekend. Going door to door to lend their backs to those who have had their driveways and walkways blocked by snow. The group behind the movement is called Project Kindness, and they are hoping to inspire others to do good. We had a dump of snow a few days ago, so I rallied a couple people in the community who just grabbed some shovels or snowblowers and said, let's go to some downtown areas that are buried and let's just help some neighbours get uh, get their vehicles or the driveways cleared up. And some people just can't get out to do it. Uh, some people are probably away on holidays. Uh, when they come back, hopefully now they'll see that their car is uh, shoveled out or a driveway, so anything to do to help. You know what, the, the goodwill is all there in the community. People want to do good things, and I keep hearing stories anyways of people mentioning that a neighbor or a stranger cleared their driveway. So I figured, why don't I just organize a bunch of people who are willing to do this, but may not, they may not know their neighbors, or may, their neighbors could have taken care of themselves. So I said, let's go to a place where we know that, you know, there's a need, and let's help some, some uh, of our fellow, you know, neighbors out. It's great. It's a great day to be out. Uh, a little bit of exercise, not too backbreaking, but uh, it's a good feeling to help your community. Oh, oh, sorry, dude. What I'm hoping is that people see this, they hear about this, and say, hey, I can do something like this. And then they organize a bunch of neighbors themselves. As they, they grab two or three people on their street, maybe their family, and say, we're going to go down the street and help our neighbors clear it out. And if they, maybe they're already doing it, great. If they weren't already, maybe this is an inspiration to get started. No one enjoys shoveling snow, but when you're doing it as a team, it's really satisfying, and it just it builds community. Love it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. While people driving in and around Edmonton in the next few days will be seeing an unusual obstruction on the road. Take a look. This is an 800-ton propane splitter used in the petrochemical industry. It's being moved from South Edmonton, where it was built, to a complex in Fort Saskatchewan, 25 kilometers away. The load is 96 meters long, 13 meters high, and it takes up two lanes of highway, plus the shoulder. It's described as the heaviest load in Alberta highway history. 
The trip routinely takes under 40 minutes, but at this size and weight, it's expected to take four days. Wow, that's incredible. The crawl began last night. Once installed, the splitter will be used to separate propylene from propane for processing into the recyclable plastic. I wouldn't want to drive behind that thing. I was just going to say, yeah. yeah. Now you know that's what you Avoid end up Avoid the road. Yeah, exactly. Stay away from that part of it. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you can always uh, find our news program online at cbc.ca slash bc. Next local news right here with Dan at 11 after the national. Have a good night. Good night.